thank you very much for joining us. We're extremely, extremely excited to have uh, Daniela De Santos, um, who has been the president of the BVA, the British Vet Association, just a whole of last year. And she was, well, to put it mildly, hopped into the whole COVID crisis. And I, uh, she has led, she has showed so much leadership in leading the vet profession in a way whereby we can still allow, uh, allow us to sort of work within the remits of what we sign up for but also taking into account of the global pandemic of COVID-19. So we are extremely grateful to have uh, Daniela over here, who is obviously a um, qualified vet as well, to here to speak with us today. So thank you very much for hopping on, Daniela. No, thank you so much for having me. <laughs> Can I just start with the most classic question? Um, why do you become a vet? Oh, well, I've known I've wanted to be a vet since I was very, very young, maybe four or five, something along those lines. And there's a distinct memory for me. We had a pet goldfish. Sorry, you can also hear my dog bouncing about in the background, but there we go. Um, I had a pet goldfish and one day the pet, the fish started swimming upside down. I got really, really upset and I forced, I forced my poor mother to poke this fish all night to make sure it stayed alive. And in the next morning when it was alive, I decided I never wanted another animal to suffer um, again. So that's my story of how I became a vet. Cool. And where did you study? So I took a bit of a longer route. So it actually took me five attempts to get into vet school. Um, so I went to secondary school, primary and secondary school in central London. So uh, not to a school that usually produces any vets. Um, and then because I couldn't get into vet school, I went to King's College in London and I did a, did a degree in molecular genetics first. And then when I finished that, I went to the Royal Veterinary College in London and studied there and qualified in 2012. Very good. And. Um... What challenges did you, uh, did you face during vet college? Ah, do you know, there are challenges, but I would say that vet college was the best time of my life. I mean, I, I'm sure you agree with me. You work really, really hard, but it's actually, you're, you almost feel like part of the family. You know, you're going through this all, all this, this really intense studying with all your friends um, and you're learning with all these incredible other vets. So I actually think it was one of the best times of my life, but of course, there were some things. I mean, financially, it was quite difficult. Um, certainly in the UK, when you're studying to be a vet, you need to do lots of placements, which means, you know, you can't necessarily get a part time job like other um, like other students can. So that was difficult. And sometimes the being away from home, you know, we would have to go and do lambing, for example, my birthday's in the spring. So I spent some of my birthdays away. So whilst there were some sacrifices, I would still say I had so much fun and, you know, very honoured to have had the opportunity. And when you started working, how did you find working life? Oh, do you know what? I've been really, really lucky. So um, when I was looking for my first job, I actually decided I wanted a job with out of hours, which is very unusual. But you get to this position where you've learned all this stuff, but you still don't have that much confidence in yourself. And I thought, you know, if I get a job with some out of hours cover, actually, I'm going to have to be slightly more confident in myself. So I don't have I don't have to call my boss at two o'clock in the morning or anything like that. And I was very, very lucky. Uh, my first job was in Buckinghamshire and I had the most amazing first job. My bosses were fabulous. It was perfect for me. Um, and I really enjoyed it. You know, I hit the ground running. Um, I like people as much as I like animals. So actually it, it, it was a fabulous start to my career. Good. It sounded as though you had a great start, which is yeah. good to hear. Yeah. And um, how did you find that you interacted with the customers? Did you feel, okay, so maybe, so I'll just ask you a first question first. Did you feel vet college has prepared you well for working life? Oh, that's a difficult question. I think yes and no is the honest answer. Mm -hmm. I think um, we have to learn so much in terms of clinical knowledge and things like that, that actually sometimes it is our own faults as students that we focus so much on all the clinical knowledge. We forget everything else that comes around it because you can know everything you want to know but if you cannot communicate that in an effective way your clients won't understand and the outcome for your patients won't be as good so I think there is an innate focus on we have to get all this clinical stuff into our heads but actually there's more to it now I guess I was lucky you know before vet school I had worked in supermarkets and waited in restaurants and things like that so you develop your communication skills with people you learn how to read people you learn that you know you need to adopt different language and different communication styles to speak to different people and that different people have different needs so do the colleges try I think they do but I think unfortunately us as students sometimes in our own heads focus too much on the clinical and don't realize that everything else is just as important 
Um, like yourself, I was a graduate from the Royal Vet College uh, back in 04. So yeah. at my time, there wasn't a lot of communication studies really. And uh, like you said, a lot of it was emphasis on the clinical aspects of it. And I can see from your personality that you obviously do not have huge issues communicating your thoughts to the public. Uh, did you feel a lot was attributed more to your personality or did college actually give you quite a lot of tools to enable to to improve the communication side of things apart from just the clinical aspects of the vet degree? I, I have to say, I think it's a bit of both. I, I have to be honest. So by the time I went through the Royal Vet College, you know, we had whole communications modules and we had actors come in. And, you know, for example, I distinctly remember when we were learning in little groups that we had, you know, various different, uh, uh, an actor that was hard of hearing. And so, you know, I got to learn how to do that in a situation that's perhaps less pressured um, because Yes, it's very real because it's a, a, a um, you know, it's, it's an acting situation. So, you know, ultimately it's not real, but it was very well stimu simulated and, you know, other things like we had um, scenarios around, you know, difficult conversations and, and, and things like that. I think there is, there is part of it that's personality, but I have to say, despite what you think, I'm not a very confident person, but I like people. And I think that's the difference here. I, I don't necessarily think it's about confidence. It's the fact that acknowledging we're all human and actually, even as a vet and a client, we ultimately want the same thing, which is what's right for the animal. Mm. We just have to talk to be able to figure out mm. what that right thing looks like because there's no sort of right or wrong answer. So I guess some of its personality, I think the benefit of you know being a postgraduate vet and having worked in retail and hospitality, that absolutely helps with communication. Mm. I do think the college are doing their best, but I guess in some situations, the students' priorities are elsewhere and perhaps they're not seeing the bigger picture that actually, once you leave college, your primary focus is having to communicate what you want to do or think should be done to the client. I, I think there's always a challenge to so-called put into perspective, cram the entire five years of education into five years, making someone who was just interested to be a vet to actually become a vet. So, you know, I, I would always challenge anybody to say, come up with a better set of syllabus if you think the current one is not good. It's, it's very challenging. It's really difficult. But, you know, the one thing that has stuck with me and, and owners don't care how much you know, they care how much you care. And, you know, certainly in my line of work, I do small animals, so cats and dogs, but I also do exotic pets. Now, um, for those of you who are listening who are not aware, you know, for exotic pets, the science isn't as good as cats or dogs. You know, for cats and dogs, we have all these papers, all these research, you know, lots of different numbers of patients. And we can say, right, we know this is the best outcome. Now, for exotic pets, you don't always have that data. And sometimes you see the weird and wonderful. And actually, clients aren't bothered if I turn around and say to them, I'm really sorry, I don't know but I'm going to find out. And they're fine because they trust you. They realize you have their best interests at heart. So yeah, yeah. How did you transit from working life to your role last year as a president of a BVA? Oh, so um, it's, a, it's a bit of a, a, a long story really. So um, as an exotic pet vet, and again, this comes back to my love of people as well as animals. I realized very early on that if I could educate one tortoise owner on how to look after their tortoise properly, I would give that tortoise 60 years of a good life. And, and that was my drive behind becoming an exotic pet vet. I don't have any exotic pets. I just realized that a lot of it is going to be about education and making that real difference long term. And so the BVA had this advert for someone to join their ethics and welfare panel. And I was only 18 months qualified at the time. And I thought, well, I'm interested in welfare. Let's give it a go. And all of a sudden, like, congratulations, you're on the panel. I was like, oh, my goodness. And then I joined it, youngest person there by a long shot. But actually, I realized that there is so much more to our degree and animal welfare than our narrow field of interest. And, you know, I started talking about things I've never spoken about before. Horses, foxes, elephants, cows, things that I would completely forgot. So did all of that. And then they were advertising for a junior vice president. And it said on it, you know, we'd welcome someone from a small animal exotic or equine background, we work as someone with a background in welfare, we welcome someone with a background in veterinary politics. And I guess once you start volunteering for organisations like the BBA, you do start understanding a bit about the politics. Now, I wasn't going to apply. Um, I was actually going to nominate someone completely different. And my partner, who's not a veterinary surgeon, not in fact, not in any form of medical industry, said to me, Daniela, why don't you just apply? So I did. And somehow, I got it. Um, <laughs> 
<laughs> that's the that's the answer. And so I uh, did my first year as junior vice president. So it was part time BBA, part time um, in clinical practice. And at that point, I was working in a really busy twenty four hour hospital. So I was juggling BBA stuff with you know working out of hours and weekends and things like that. And then last September, I became the president. Fascinating. Uh, you know, I knew we'd have a general election. I knew we had EU exit on the horizon. All of that, but yeah, we're gonna be prepared for that. And then boom, global pandemic, declared on my birthday. Um, and I was thrust into this situation that there are no textbooks for this. There is no one to tell you how you do this. And so I just kind of, I kind of looked at my own values and honesty and integrity and compassion are what matter to me whether you're a vet, whether you work in a supermarket, whether you are a dentist, whether you are a lawyer, whether you're a teacher, honesty, integrity and compassion get you a long way because people will talk to you and people will trust you. And so when I realized the profession, like everyone else was thinking, what on earth is going on? How do, how do we work through this? Actually, that's when I stepped up and said, right, this is what's going on. I don't have all the answers. You know, this could happen, but let's all pull together. And I have been incredibly, incredibly proud of how the veterinary profession has pulled together. It's been incredible to see. And, you know, for those of you listening, vets on the ground have been working flat out since March. I cannot emphasize that enough. Flat out since March. You know, we initially went down to emergency and urgent work. We're now trying to do as much as possible in the context of social distancing, in the context of trying to catch up um, with, you know, work that we've had to put off for a while. And I'm now back on the ground working as well. And we all care and we're there doing our absolute best and i'd like to say thank you to the vets and the nurses and all the other members of the team listening for the incredible work but also thank you to owners who've actually been really understanding understanding of the way things have changed understanding of the delays and the decision making process and so i ended up starting saying the whole profession needs to work together but actually we're at a point now that the profession and animal owners and farmers we're all working together to try and maintain animal health and welfare well done. So just for the audience who don't really see the perspective of this, uh, I'll just explain a little bit. So in the vet profession, we have got a few uh, leader bodies, so to speak. So we've got the Royal College of Veterinary Surgeons, the RCVS. We've got the uh, British Vet Association, the BVA. And we also have got the BSAVA, the British Small Animal Vet Association, with a lot of other little subgroups. So Danella was fundamentally the principal, uh, the president for BVA and single-handedly, she was the voice of what to actually lead the entire 5,000 vets in UK of what to do, what the recommendations are, what is okay, what is not okay, what's the current thought. So as you can imagine, um, not being, well, there's no playbook for this and making any statement, you're also going to generate a huge amount of um, dissatisfaction and people who do not uh, agree because you try to get the world to agree. That is whew, impressive. So uh, she has done an amazing job in navigating such that the vet profession is how it is right now. And bearing in mind that, you know, she, that there was no playbook for this. So with that, you know, I've, I've always watched from a distance to what BB is going to come out next, what is the Nell going to come out next. And so far, I have to say, in my opinion, uh, it's been spot on and it's been extremely encouraging and very positive. And uh, she certainly did much, much more good in terms of maintaining the integrity of the profession and also maintaining the sort of uh, the bad provision to the animals um, such that we are still where we are right now. And I, th I believe one of the hardest things that she probably had to say from the very, very first time when lockdown first happened was that yes, we have sworn to help all the animals, but human lives come first. And that was difficult con con considering we are vets that, you know, we're not doctors. And <laughs> we have that fluffy thing in our head to say that we are vets because we're animals, animals, we must save animals no matter what happened. Uh, but, you know, that was that was uh, quite a huge challenge for the whole vet profession to rally behind that. So thank you very much, Nanella, for that. No, it's a pleasure. And, and, you know, that wasn't the only difficult part of the message. So absolutely, you know, um, for those of you listening that aren't aware, um, even before, the, I think it was 24 hours before the Prime Minister put the whole country into lockdown, um, I had a webinar for the profession. We had over 7,000 people watching it um, and we made sure that it was available to everyone. This wasn't about whether you're a BVA member or not, whether you're a receptionist, vet, vet nurse, it was for everyone to join us. And actually, I stood up and I said, uh, I know what I'm about to tell you may cause some businesses to really struggle. And, you know, that's difficult for someone in my position to turn around and say to vets, 
this you know your businesses could go under and like you say i had to turn around and say we have to put human health first i had to stand up and say this is the right thing to do and yes whilst i'm the one that said it the profession embraced it the profession went with it that first those first three weeks were difficult for everybody you know we went against everything that we as vets you know would stand for you know turning away things that normally we'd be like yep come in now and and having to make these decisions and i think i'm very proud of how the profession's done and and since you know i think at the beginning i don't know if you agree the messaging to owners was slightly difficult you know it's an overnight switch and some owners found it very difficult to understand but actually as time has gone on we're all in this together now um you know we're, we're trying to offer as best service and I, I don't know about you but not all practices are letting clients into their premises at the moment and that's very much an individual decision and so it should be but clients are being so understanding of whatever we've put in place so yeah thank you to clients as well yeah well thank you very much for that um what are your thoughts uh, still on this covid topic you know over the next year it's going to be well, it's going to be a so-called new norm already. We never ever go back to the no, old normal, not for the next at least few years. Um, what are your thoughts of how the veterinary profession will be progressing on in terms of increase in vigilance, increase of uh, running protective, uh, personal protective uh, equipment, PPEs, uh, in sort of a cleanings between uh, the, the cleaning between consultations? Uh, what sort of effect do you think they'll have impact on the profession itself? So I think there's, there's a couple of things in there. I think it's really, really important to highlight from the top that actually the most important thing in everything we do is social distance where possible and keep your hygiene up. That is above any form of PPE. And that is the same whether you're in the professional or out. Now, there are certain situations in our profession that you can't maintain social distancing. You know, you're taking blood from a cat or something like that. But things like, you know, keeping a receptionist separate, screens, things like that, there are ways of doing it. So above all, I think some form of social distancing is here for a, I would say medium to long term, if we're being realistic. Mm. I don't think we're going to go back to not being aware of how close we are to our colleagues or not being aware that we should be working in pairs and things like that for, for a, a while. In terms of PPE, now that's an interesting one. So um, there is a level of PPE that, uh, let's backtrack a bit, track and trace is an ultimate problem here. But I say problem, but I don't mean it is a problem. It is a good system that is right to be in place to try and slow down the progression of this virus. No doubt there. And uh, just to be clear, there is no implication here that vets shouldn't be partaking in it. We absolutely should. It's our civic duty to be part of the solution and not the problem. Having said that, we are in a challenging situation where some practices are small or you can't socially distance from other people. And we're left in a situation that if one person comes down positive, it could shut the whole practice. And that is the challenge that we are facing. And if you think about it, in some parts of the country, that will have a huge impact, you know, particularly rural areas or remote areas where, you know, the next practice is not for another 30 miles or so. Actually, you, with the practice closing down, you could end up with a large area without, without veterinary cover. And so, there is a level of PPE that you can be wearing and not be considered to be a contact for the purposes of contact tracing. Now, the important thing about that is what matters is what the positive person was wearing. So if you and I were working together, for example, and I came down positive, it's me that has that initial conversation with the contact tracer. Therefore, I have to say to the contact tracer, at work, I was wearing this. And they will say, fine, these people are probably not contacts. But it doesn't, but if you were then to be called, you couldn't say to them, but I will PP at work because you wouldn't actually know who the positive contact was. They don't give you that information. So in the long term, I think some form of social distancing and hand hygiene and all of that and, and face coverings will be here for a significant period of time. In terms of PPE, the honest answer is I'm not sure. I think it will depend on levels of virus and circulation, the risk profile. It will depend on practices as well because you know there is an environmental impact of all the PPE we're wearing as well mm -hmm. um, and it may be that some practices where they can work in bubbles you know they have a vet and a nurse that work together all day and another one they may choose to only wear face coverings and and practice good hand hygiene because actually if one of them came down there is still veterinary care provision mm -hmm. so I think it's going to be a moving feast I think it's going to change mm -hmm. um, and and be different in different areas as we go through this mm -hmm. Okay, um, yeah, thanks for that. I, I, I totally mirror your thoughts. I think it, it's going to be flexible because yeah. it just changes how it, we're going to enter winter soon. We're going to see what that is like as well as environmental factors as well. 
Um, could you tell us a bit more about your experience? Okay, COVID was a huge thing, but your experience as a BVA president. So, you know, what, what, what did you feel was expected? Did it live up to expectations? Were you surprised? What thoughts, what sort of feelings did you get when you were actually a president of BVA? So it's not something I ever thought I would do or ever considered doing. So, you know, getting chosen was, it was one of those situations where I applied and thought nothing of it. And then to get chosen was absolutely incredible. And I have to say, despite everything, because there have been challenges, it has been the absolute honour of my life to represent the profession I love. Um, I still maintain that the veterinary profession is the best profession in the world. And to be able to be the person leading that has been a real honour. Now, in terms of what I was expecting. Now, I, I, I knew that there would be things like political lobbying, a lot around the general election, EU exit, workforce issues, regulatory issues. I knew there would be a lot of, of that. But I was also determined to use my time to um, talk about vet diversity. And when I say vet diversity, I mean the range of people in our profession, but also the range of skills we do. So I'm very passionate about widening particip participation in our profession. I am very passionate about knocking down those barriers that make kids like me think they could never be a vet. You know, I grew up in one of the most deprived um, boroughs in London. My parents are immigrants. My mother's a cleaner. My dad was a chef. I didn't have anyone that went to university in my family, let alone had any interest in science. And I don't, I don't like the thought that there could be another child just like me who wouldn't even think about becoming a vet because they think it's not for them. So my passion has been about that but also about diversity in the roles we play. Now, you and I are speaking because we're in small animal clinical practice. You know, we have that in common. But actually, there are vets working everywhere. Of course, there are vets working with farm animals, with horses, with zoo animals. We have vets in laboratories. There are even vets working on the COVID vaccine right now, for example. We have vets in government. We have research scientists. We have teachers. We have vets in, in pharmaceutical industries. And so it was really important to me to highlight the variety of work we do and the value that vets bring across society. So I've been really pleased with my vet diversity initiative and, and the push on that. And certainly I feel we are talking more about the diverse careers that are available out there to us and having people really think about what, what they would like to do and how they'd like to use their skill set. That is a very interesting because uh, classically, if you sort of, if we sort of reverse uh, rewind uh, 20, 30 years ago when people said you're a vet, usually they would think some form of clinical practitioner uh, sometimes they may extend to you know uh, working for drug companies or working in the labs but i think what you have just mentioned is quite different um what could you elaborate a little bit more of what exactly is involved in vet diversity and um, what how are we how are yourself and that organization projecting that to the outside audience to show that vets are not just like a typical james harriet so to speak yeah so um when we say James Herriot, it often evokes lots of emotions and, and for James Herriot himself, he was an incredible role model of his time and for many vets in practice now, he is the reason they wanted to be a vet and he was fantastic yeah, for you as well, there you go. And, 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 he, and he, you know, when you, when you look at his stories, he talks about the empathy, the, the, the human aspect and all of that. So we've done various things. So uh, I did a time for change sort of drive a lot before COVID, looking at, you know, we need to change the way we perceive um, what a vet is. I've taken part in National Health Careers Conferences, which is the largest widening participation program in, in the UK. Um, we have done things like we had a whole suite of, when I became president in our, um, in our journal, there was a whole double or eight page spread, I can't remember, um, with lots of different vets. We all looked completely different and we all did different roles, just celebrating their different roles. We have a website called My Vet Future, which is basically a careers hub that runs from you know, four or five years old all the way to retirement. And on there, we have made the effort to have all the different roles that we play in society. You know, there explained what a day in the life of means, involves and things like that. And certainly most recently, we have our Good Workplace Initiative, which is looking at how we can improve veterinary workplaces. And there's a whole aspect in there about the diverse range of careers. So we're trying really hard to get the message out there. Part of it, to members of the public, but also to our own profession, to say, do you know, you don't just have to consider doing, you know, cattle dog work or cattle work. You know, if you enjoy the science part of it, have you considered research and, and so on? So it's about reframing how we think about ourselves as well as the public. And slightly associated to, or connected to what you've just discussed about diversity, I'd like to talk a little bit, uh, I'd like your perspective on the 
the sort of a current uh, potential issues that we are actually facing within the profession itself. So as we know, you know the the depression in the vet profession is fairly high, and vet life, which is the equivalent for Samaritans, um, has always reported for the last few years doubled in telephone calls of the vet profession actually asking for help. Uh, to in their lives. We also know that the attrition rate, the dropout rate is also quite high. Two years ago, Space they pro uh, provided some info on 38% of vets want to um, would leave the profession if they could afford it. And we also know suicide, unfortunately, is also very, very high, whereby uh, being in a profession, the more twice more likely to end our lives compared to the medical profession and four times more likely than the general public. Um, what are your thoughts on this? Like, why would it be like this? Uh, like, why, why do we have such uh, issues like that in this profession? Yeah, so I, I think this is a very complex and sensitive topic. Mm. I think um, we have become much better at talking about mental health. Um, and it is good. It is good that we are more open in talking about our mental health. That can only be positive. But we also need to make sure that we talk about the mental health issues in our profession in a responsible way and it would be wrong to say that there is one single factor that is leading to the mental health crisis in our profession that is not true it wouldn't be true to say that it's just workplaces or work hours or workload or client interactions it, 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 that is just not the truth now there's various data out there so um the bba did their motivation retention and satisfaction study with the university of exeter that was looking at why it is that um vets are looking to leave the profession and generally speaking what we're looking at is that the sense of fitting in really matters so the sense of being valued by your colleagues and um, the sense that you are seen as a reliable source of information the sense that your work is valuable to the team really really matters it's about inclusion ultimately and it's also about flexible working um, there are issues there that um, one thing COVID has shown is that we as a profession can work more flexibly and it's something that for 30 years we were saying oh no no we've done it the same way forever mm -hmm. so it's about how we feel as human beings mm -hmm. and the thing is if, if we as human beings are feeling that we're not valued mm -hmm. then ultimately if we look at our workload if our workload is high and we feel undervalued mm -hmm. it's a compounding impact if we feel valued and we have a high workload, there is a slightly greater tolerance there. That we are also overworked. You know, there is mismanagement in terms of how our rotors are done, and you know, it's it's quite often to work. It's quite common to work 11, 12 hour days, four or five days a week. It's not sustainable. So there are a combination of things there. And in the middle of that as well, in the middle of that study, something about discrimination came up. And so it was found that discrimination was having a real impact. And we did a subsequent study about gender discrimination in profession. And the reason we did that is that we have passed the 50-50 mark in terms of um, genders of those that are practicing. And in the student population, about 80% now are female. So, so there is a gender shift in our profession going from a predominantly male profession to a predominantly female profession. And interesting, this has all happened in a very short period of time because up until 100 years ago, women couldn't be vets. And, and I believe it was somewhere in the 70s, up until the 70s, there was a quota. So a maximum number of women that could enter the profession. So we've had a swing very quickly. Mm. Um, and actually, when we looked at gender discrimination, there was a, a study that showed that if all else were equal, um, same CV, same age quality, everything, but the, difference, the only difference was the name Mark and Elizabeth, Mark would be paid more, seen as more competent, more likely to be putting, um, pushed for promotion. Now, mm. that is an unconscious bias, which is a problem. But then if you compound the fact with the majority of the profession is female, they are overworked, they don't feel valued, and there's evidence that they are not being valued. Mm. It just, your sense of self-worth declines. Mm. And it is this perpetual constant thing that's a problem. And so mm. we then looked at discrimination wider, uh, and we did a, a, a wider discrimination survey. And we found very high levels of racism. Um, that is concerning because at the time, only 3% of um, the veterinary profession uh, identified us from a black, Asian or minority ethnic background. And it was the second most reported form of discrimination. Um, as well as if you were from a LGBT plus background, the younger you were, if you were female, you're all more likely to be discriminated against. And the biggest concern there is that there were two common um, areas of discrimination one was from managers and people in leadership and the other was from clients so if you compound this all together you're overworked don't have adequate breaks it's a very emotional job you know you have the lives of animals in your hands so it's emotionally draining if you don't feel valued 
if you are being discriminated against, you put it all together and of course we're going to be suffering. And we, through our duty to animals, we kind of just put up with it and put up with it and we have reached a breaking point where we just can't carry on. So BVA has done a, an initiative that launched only last month called the Good Veterinary Workplace. And so we've looked at what it means to be a good veterinary workplace. And it's quite a big document, seven chapters, but actually is to try and help the profession row back on, on the aspect. So yes, we have mental health challenges in the profession. It is great that we are talking about that, it's important, but it's important that we talk about them accurately and realize that there's not a single factor that is feeding into this and that we as a profession need a culture change in order to make things better. Okay, and I suppose my next question would be uh, well, fairly loaded as one as well and feel free to say that you can't answer it because it is fair enough. Apart from the Good Workplace initiative that is taken by BVA, which is very, very interesting and I do believe that that is a good step towards that. Um, what other changes do we need to see? What other things that need to happen? Or let's, let's, uh, let's push it even more abstract. Let's pretend you have a magic wand mm. and you can put something in place to help this situation over here. What would your thoughts be? Uh, I would need multiple magic wands <laughs> would be my first thing because it is not one factor. You know, it is what it is not I change one individual thing and things will get better. It, mm. it just doesn't work like that. But for me, one of them is we need to manage in practices uh, the timing better. We need our rotors managed better. It, mm. We cannot continue whereby vets are expected to work through their lunch break because that's the way it's always been. You just can't, you know, you can only sustain that for so long. And so to me, there needs to be better management of, um, of rotors and uh, appointment systems and surgical systems to factor in the fact that we are human beings. And actually the more exhausted we are, the less effective we are at work. Therefore that needs to change. Above all though, I think it's about communication and it's about honesty. We cannot instigate any form of change, whether it's a cultural change, whether it's a rotor change, where it's just a change about being able to go to your manager and saying, I'm sorry, I'm feeling really down or, you know, articulating that you value someone else from your team. We cannot do that unless we have open and honest communication. And I sometimes feel that we forget to do that with each other. You know, often feel like it's a breakdown of communication that's just perpetuated over this cycle and cycle and cycle. Um, and we forget to listen to each other. We listen to our clients, but do we listen to each other? So I think we need to change the rotors and the systems and this expectation that it's normal to work 12 hour days and not have a lunch break. That is not normal, nor should it be. Um, but we need to talk to each other because in the Good Wet and Workplaces, the one thing it says is that this is a team effort. It's about employers and employees working together and that culture is different in every practice. So we all have a responsibility as employers to be clear about what the culture in the practice is and employees to be clear about what your culture is and finding the jobs that suit each other because it's naive to think that all jobs are gonna suit all people. Of course they won't. So it's th I think it's about talking to each other, listening to each other and working together. What is your view on the future of veterinary medicine? I know this is a little bit more far-fetched, but obviously it has changed quite a lot since, you know, back in the 70s, 80s. Um, what, what do you think veterinary medicine looks like, say, 10, 20 years from now? I think the reality is we're a scientific profession and so things will always change. We will always know more. Um, we will likely be able to do more. Um, I think the challenge will come, in, I think, just because we can doesn't mean we should. You know, we are there to protect animal welfare and there may be lots of scientific developments in the future that make certain things possible. But I think we as a profession will be questioning whether we should, you know, is it in the right interest of the animal? I think that um, we are looking at a more integrated medicine approach, I think, as we go forward. I think, um, you know, there's a vet led team concept where basically the vet sits in the middle of the treatment of all the animal, but actually we will delegate out to, you know, you have a cruciate operation on a dog you delegate out to appropriately trained physiotherapists for example or you know RVN so I think it will become a more integrated model where we will be using the skills of our paraprofessionals more appropriately and perhaps freeing up more of our time to do more directly vet related stuff if that makes sense I think the use of technology is here in some shape or form I think COVID has pushed the use of remote technology on us faster than we as a profession were ready to do. Um, there has definitely been some positives and some negatives. So I think the future of the profession is more scientific knowledge, um, perhaps more use of technology, but ultimately it's still going to be about a partnership between those involved 
in maintaining animal health and welfare or advising on the maintaining of animal health and welfare and pet owners. That is never going to change. This is always going to be a team effort and education and communication is always going to be part of, of that. Mm. Thanks for that. There is so much content you've provided us in the last half an hour. I probably have to read <laughs> this again and take notes again. <laughs> a lot of stuff in there. So thank you very much. What, what, how would the audience, uh, how, would, how, how would people reach you if they wanted to find out more about Bad Diversity and what you're doing with the organisation over there? Where, where would they go? So um, if you are a child listening um, or an adult considering a change in career or um, wanting to know more about what we do, My Vet Future website is a very good website to go to. Of course, there is the BVA website that will have all our initiatives on there, um, including what we're broadly call it, calling an inclusive profession, which talks about you know, vet diversity, time for change and good veterinary workplaces. Um, and of course, you can email in um, to the BVA and we can get in touch. Thank you very much, Nella. It's been extremely informative, and uh, it's you know it's it's a rare insight to hear from one of uh, our, our leaders that was uh, you know watching from the very top to give a good perspective from there. So thank you very much for that.